Good morning, and welcome to Noah's Window. It's Thursday, April 23rd, and I'm Mary Alice Hoover. I'm hoping that you're off to a good start this early Thursday morning, and I want to just share a few things with you. Um, first of all, uh, I was waking up a couple of days ago and, and opened up my Bible, and it landed in Matthew 18, and it was uh, Jesus talking to his disciples. But um, I guess it was fresh on my mind, this particular passage, because I've been spending a little time with some of my grandchildren. Um, it's uh, They're so special to my heart. I, I raised three boys, but the grandkids um, are just, they're just special. You know, I think when you're raising your kids, you're so busy taking care of all the necessities. Um, it's a different perspective. Plus, when you're parenting, you're learning parenting as you go. I guess you learn grandparenting as you go too, but um, I think you appreciate and treasure different things as a grandparent. So I, I truly treasure my grandchildren. Um, but just to set up the scenario in Matthew 18 at the beginning of the chapter, we're getting close to the time of the crucifixion. And um, I think Mark just shared this in a recent message, but the disciples, although Jesus is really sharing his heart and telling them in plain language what's about to happen and how serious it's going to be and how he's going to be crucified and how he's going to be resurrected, and they're still arguing among themselves about who's going to be the greatest. And it's... Um, it's, it's kind of hard to read, and yet in a way it's almost kind of comforting to read to know how normal the disciples were, to let us know we're normal as well. So um, we get some very real things right there. In fact, I would just say as an aside too, one of the things I love about the Bible is the good, bad, and the ugly is all here. You know, if we were going to write a story, we might want to choose to leave some details out um, just because it would look a little better, um, but God chose to let us see everything as it was, I think, to help us understand the reality and the truth of what he's, he's telling us. So here we are, the disciples, they're kind of clueless, although Jesus has told them so many important things, and they're still dwelling on this, who's the greatest, who's the greatest. So let me read you a little bit of this in Matthew chapter 18. It says, about that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and put the child among them. He's so good at, at uh, object lessons, isn't he? Then he said, Jesus, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, keep in mind who he's talking to, Jesus. and He's, he's telling them, unless you, you disciples, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children. That had to be extremely confusing to them at that particular moment, or maybe it was an aha moment to them, because um, children are, are perceived to be less than. They're smaller than. They're considered to not be as smart because we're educating them. They don't always process the whole big picture very well. We would say they're maybe naive. They're vulnerable. So it wouldn't have made sense to them to be the greatest to be like a little child. But what a beautiful illustration. And I love to refer to the Amplified translation from time to time because it gives more clarity on the language. And in the Amplified, when it says, um, when Jesus said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children, in parentheses or in brackets, becoming like little children. He's not saying be smaller, be dumber. He's saying, but this is what the word alludes to. Be humble trusting and forgiving like a little child. Now I want to pause there for just a moment because I, and over the years I've talked to so many hurting people, many, many hurting people. And you know, a lot of times people carry so much bitterness and hurt and anger. And a lot of times that's directed toward God. But if you, if you just scratch below the surface just a little bit, when they were a child, when they were vulnerable and they were humble, and trusting and forgiving toward the person that they relied on, they were betrayed and they were harmed and, and they weren't, their trust was not well placed. And it's so hard for a child who grows into an adult to deal with that. Of course, it's hard for that child, they're helpless. But as we grow into adulthood, that feeling, that feeling of being betrayed often does not go away. And so we can say, well, I'm not going to do that, be humble, trusting, and forgiving, because I've tried that, and that didn't work very well. But think about this for a minute. If we're humble and trusting and forgiving towards someone who will never let us down, who, who keeps every promise, 
let me say that one again, who keeps every promise, who loves us every day, no matter what's going on. If we're humble and trusting and forgiving with that person, that's different. And that's what God is asking us to do. Be humble and trusting and forgiving. Not that we don't need to have these attitudes in general. But the most important thing is that we can be humble and trusting and forgiving toward God who will never let us down, who has kept and is keeping every promise He's ever made. So please don't let some pain from the past ruin your relationship with God because some human being let you down. And there's so many. It just breaks my heart, the stories. It just breaks my heart. And what it does to us as adults, so much so much hurt that we're carrying with us. And by the way, this is not new. If you ever pick up a history book or a newspaper and, and just go back, it doesn't matter whether you go back weeks, months, years, millennia, it, this is an old story. We as human beings, we tend to hurt each other. That's what we do. But remember, God is the one who loves us. He will not disappoint us. There's an old song. I'm, I'm old, so I'm full of old songs. But there's an old song I loved. It was called, There's No Disappointment in Jesus. I promise you, I promise you, He will never disappoint you. He will keep every one of His promises. Now, where we get in trouble sometimes is, sometimes people think God promised them something He didn't promise them. I've had so many ladies sit in my office and say, well, God promised that I that He wants me to be happy. Well, no, actually, He didn't promise that. He promised to be with you. He promised to meet your needs, to provide for you, to guide you. All these things He promised. He promised, most important, He promised to forgive your sins. He did not promise for you to be happy in this life. In fact, if you look carefully, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, what He did assure us of is trouble in this life. He, let me say that again. He promised us we were going to have trouble. Okay? This life is not heaven. Heaven's coming, and I'm so excited about it. But this isn't it, okay? If you haven't noticed, this isn't it. But all the promises that he made, he keeps. He keeps. He never goes back on a promise. You know, we as parents, we do our best, don't we? Sometimes we overpromise. We don't mean to. We overpromise. And we say this and so is going to happen, and then it doesn't work out. And I know um, in our life, things were up and down. For instance, in ministry, you, you don't know when there's going to be a funeral or an emergency or all kinds of things that happen, and you can plan all day long, but something could easily de derail that. It's hard to explain that to little children. And so we, we developed this phrase, I'll make it up to you. Have you ever heard that one? I, I know, I promised, I know, I will make it up to you. God didn't ever have to do that, not one single time. He will never say, I know I broke that promise, but I'll make it up to you. No, 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 he didn't. What he did say is the things that you suffer for my sake in this life, I'll make them up to you. Think about that one for a while. That's not on my scripture today. I'm sorry I rambled. They shouldn't give me a microphone. That's what happens. Okay, so here's the thing. Humble, trusting, forgiving as a child. If we can be before our Heavenly Father, humble, trusting, and forgiving, and say, wait, forgive God? Well, I'm not a theologian, so discount it, okay? Discount, disclaim. But let's think about that a minute. Most of the people I have talked to who claim to be non-theist, atheist, don't believe in God, will argue with you that he doesn't exist. My experience has been they actually do believe in God, but they're angry with God. And so their ultimate punishment with this God with whom they're angry is to give him the coldest shoulder possible to declare that he doesn't exist, to live their life as though he doesn't exist. So why do I say that? A lot of times when we're going through life and maybe we've prayed about something and it didn't work out the way we ask God to make it work out, we become angry with God. Now, I'm not saying there's, there's nothing that we should forgive God for, but from the human perspective, when we have hurts that God doesn't take away, there's part of that trusting and forgiving that kind of gets all folded together. You know, we can say to God, I'm sad that this happened, and it hurts, and you know it hurts. By the way, he hurts along with us, as any loving parent does. And we can say, this hurts, I don't understand. We can express our frustration. We can express our hurt. But we can say, but God, I still love you. I still trust you. I, don't, I haven't, I haven't um, declared that you don't exist, even when I don't understand, and even when it hurts. So let's just decide. 
for this God who loves us, who's made the ultimate sacrifice for us, that we can be humble and trusting and forgiving with him because he loves us more than we can imagine. He does. Even in these hard times, he loves us. Now, um, I was... um, Looking through some of the the songs that the worship team has been singing recently, and this one really struck a chord with me. And it says, the name of it is, Lord, I need you. The, the beginning of it says, Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, and we do need him. And he's standing right there waiting. So we're looking forward to hearing the worship team sing that song this morning. Wasn't that wonderful? Thank you, worship team, for sharing that. Aren't they? I just so love our worship team and what a great job they do. And where their heart is, you can just tell us they're singing where their heart is. Okay, so humble, trusting, and forgiving. Let's keep that in mind as we think about. And by the way, remember the promise on that is to be great in his kingdom. Um, you know, we all like greatness, don't we? But the place to be great is in God's kingdom. And what a joy it is to serve. Uh, that is that is my heart's joy, is to serve uh, God and, and just be part of what He's doing. I wish we had time to share with you so many things that God is doing. I, we just hear story day after day 
um, that just keeps us smiling and rejoicing because God is busy. I know these are hard times. I know these are difficult times, but know this. God is busy at work, and He's busy at work in a really good way. God is connecting with people that didn't have time for Him before, and now He's blessing them with a peace and a comfort and provision and just wonderful things that God is doing that we're hearing stories of day after day. So continue on to understand that God is still busy at work. He isn't on vacation. He isn't, he isn't quarantined somewhere. God is busy, and He's doing great things. So... Um, before we uh, close today, I just want to say a couple of things. One is, can't wait to see you in New Spring. Can't wait to see you back on campus, filling those hallways, filling those rooms. I'm looking forward to that time. In the meantime, let's continue to pray for one another. I know there's sickness that's just rippling through. Um, of course, we get a lot of the calls, and, and there's much sadness, much concern. Um, so please continue to pray for one another. And as we think about prayer this morning, I, I would just like to say this. Um, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, maybe a friend asked you to tune in today. And maybe you've been grappling with some of these things, but, but you you just really know that you need Him. You just really know that you need God to come into your life. I want to just help you do that today. It's, it's, not, it's not complicated. You don't need to go to a class or you don't need to. There's, all this is about is God is reaching out to you and asking you to receive from Him a free gift of salvation. Now, what Jesus did for us when He came to earth and, and died on the cross, He paid for our sins, all of our sins. From the smallest little little white lie that we think of, you know, we categorize sins, and we, and we kind of categorize people and sinners, and we kind of have our own little system going. But the problem is, the Bible tells us that everyone has sinned. And all it takes is one sin to put us over in the sinner category. So we all have a, we all have a similar problem. We all have the same problem if we're a human being. We're all sinners. And so we have this sinner disease that needs to be cured. It's much worse than the coronavirus. We all need to be cured from this disease of sin. And we're so helpless. We don't have a cure. There is no vaccine. The only cure for our sin is what Jesus did for us. So when he came and he lived that perfect life and he died that death. The Bible tells us in Colossians that he actually stamped paid in full on our sin invoice. You know, I always think about the invoices. Again, I'm old, so I've lived a lot of life now. You know, if you think about the, the worst bill that you dread, the one that you hate going to the mailbox to open up because you just know when you look at it, you say, I could never pay this. I know I'll never pay it. It's just too much. It's just too big. And you just dread it. And it hangs over you day and night. Think about an illustration with our sin because we have a sin invoice all of us do all of us do you can you can doctor it up all you want to but we all have this what we owe God because we're sinners and God didn't just say sorry you owe it you pay it God had a plan he sent his son to die on the cross and as I said Colossians says what he did is he canceled it he canceled our sin debt when he died on the cross it didn't mean that sin didn't matter. He didn't say it didn't happen. He didn't say it didn't hurt. He didn't say it wasn't meant. He said, I'm going to pay for it. And that's what Jesus did when he died on the cross. And in response to that, all he asked of us is to say, yes, Lord, I, I take this free gift. He's paid the price. He's offering it, this forgiveness. But he won't force it on us. It's only if we say, yes, I receive that forgiveness. I don't understand everything. I haven't learn the Bible cover to cover. I just know I have this problem. I need Jesus in my life. So if that is who, where you are in your life right now, I want to pray with you. And not that I have any magic words. There are no magic words. It's just the words from your heart saying, yes, yes, I want Jesus to be my Lord and Savior. I want to be part of God's family. And that's what I want us to do now is we have prayer. So please pray with me. Father, what a privilege it is to represent you. I know I'm so unworthy, and I just pray even now that you would take my my clumsy words and use them to be a blessing to the hearts of those who might be listening. But Lord, if, if there's someone out there who doesn't know for sure that they're going to go to heaven when this life is over, when they don't, if they don't know for sure what's going to happen to their sin problem, I pray that this would be the time that they would just take a moment and with all their heart, with all the sincerity of their heart, they would say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I don't understand everything, but I do believe Jesus died for my sins. I believe he rose on that third day. 
And I believe he is offering me forgiveness. And so I'm asking and saying, yes, Lord, I want that forgiveness. I want to be part of your family. I want to receive what Jesus did for me. I want to live a new life, a life as part of your family, a life following your leadership and your lordship. And I'm asking you that today. And I just pray, that, Lord, from my heart, that you would give all of these people who are watching courage to do that even today. Give them the faith, give them the strength, give them the courage to reach out, if not in this moment, in the very near future. And Lord, I'm going to thank you for all the lives that you are changing, that we're hearing about every day. Thank you for your presence and your comfort and your peace and, and even your excitement during this coronavirus time. Just thank you, Lord, for loving us so much and for being so faithful. Thank you for taking us through this. And we're looking forward to that time where we can uh, see a new world that you're going to put together. And we're going to trust you for that because you are faithful to keep all your promises. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Now, I know I'm, I'm not as good as Mark. I'm for sure. My words are so clumsy. And thank you for uh, bearing with me. But I do want to say this. If you prayed, whatever your prayer sounded like, it doesn't. It, it's not It's not the words that are important. It's your, your heart and what you said when you reached, reached out to the Lord. So if you did, if you just prayed and you said, Lord, I don't understand all this, but I want to be forgiven and I want to be your child. We have some things we would love to share with you. So one of those things is a Bible. This Bible is, um, it says New Spring Church on the cover, but it's an NLT translation of the Bible that's easy to read. And also we have a book called My New Walk with God, where Mark answers a lot of questions that, that we all have. We all have had, if, we're, if we don't have them today, we have had them. And this is a great little book that gives some clear, distinct answers to those questions. So I hope that you will let us know so we can share this with you. So how do I do that, you might say. If you would text the word PRAYED, P-R-A-Y-E-D, to 97,000, we will get these to you. If you're in the continental United States, if you're out of the country, we have some electronic versions we would get to you. But we definitely want to reach out to you and help you in this new journey that you're on. The second thing I want to talk to you about is something we have at New Spring called Starting Point. And Starting Point, when we're on campus, is this amazing small group environment where we invite people to bring questions and we have this great curriculum we walk through for eight weeks. Uh, of course, now we can't meet on campus, but we have been able to convert Starting Point to an online environment. And so if you still have so many questions saying, you know, I, I kind of am interested in this, but I have too many questions to move forward right now. Starting Point is a great place to bring your questions. So here's the thing. If you would text SP online to 97000, we will get back with you and give you information just to see if it's something you're interested in. We'll just share with you some things you can look at, have a conversation with you if you, if you wish, and see if you want to be uh, involved in that. We actually are about to launch our fourth uh, starting Point online group, excuse me, which I'm so excited about. I've been involved in Starting Point now for about 15 years plus. So I'm very passionate about Starting Point, but it's so exciting to see it go online with these groups and they're going really well. So if you're interested in that, again, if you'll text SP online to 97,000, we'd love to hear from you. And then the last thing, I know there are many of you out there who are tuning in for various different reasons and welcome. We're so glad that you're participating, but we would love to hear from you. If you would just text talk to us to 97,000, just introduce yourself. If you've got a question or a comment, just any kind of feedback, take me all off. <laughs> uh, anything you want to share with us, we would love to hear from you. We would. I know uh, there's also a place where you can put up your prayer request, and there are so many needs during these hours. And, you know, that's part of what we're called to do as Christ followers. We're called to meet needs and to care and to serve, and we want to do that. So until the next time, I want to say thank you for tuning in. Thank you for joining us at Noah's Window, and we will see you soon. God bless.